Today we have a special guest on our show, Russian philosopher and the founder of the Eurasianist movement, Alexander Gelievich Dugin. Hello, Alexander. Hello. And most of you have some idea who Alexander is, although some of you might have a distorted view, uh, and we, we will hope to rectify it during our conversation. I will briefly introduce ourselves to you, Alexander, and for those who just found us. But before that, um, let me ask a traditional starting question. What are you drinking right now? I'm drinking some puer tea, and it's pretty nice. I'm drinking kefir. <laughs> mm. Great. You are lucky, guys. You don't drink anything right now, I take it. That's good. All right. So let me introduce ourselves. Um, we are two Russian guys. My name is Nikolai and my co-host's name is Kirill. Kirill has a formal and informal training in history. And I used to be a prolific uh, Twitter contrarian. We started our podcast back in 2020. Our main mission was to talk about interesting things and to present Russia's history and reality in English language in a different light because we were sick and tired of being caricatured and misrepresented. And uh, typically Russians uh, fail miserably at uh, public relations uh, department and all that's left to our public image be it negative or positive, are matryoshka dolls, bears, vodka, and hot women, perhaps. And we try to change that, or at least make a dent in this old tired image. Alexander, you are currently the most known Russian philosopher in the world. And some of your claim is entirely of your own making, because you, re you have written many books, translated them, and learned many tongues yourself. But... I think that part of your name recognition is due to misrepresentation by American mainstream media in particular, and their decision to turn you into a sort of a boogeyman with which they scare average Americans. Uh, so my first question will be, what do you do with the unwanted and offensive labels that are being slapped on you, such as uh, Putin's brain or fascist mysticist and, and whatnot? Or did you learn to embrace it? So first of all, I think that there are two levels in this image. Uh, it has nothing to do with my ideas, uh, and sometimes, um, for example, describing my so-called fascism, they are citing my own works where I criticize radically fascism as communism and liberalism, by the way, but fascism as well. So uh, nobody cares. For example, in Wikipedia, there are uh, many articles uh, written on myself uh, well, and many topics, many issues uh, have in them incorrect biographical facts, for example. The, the pure bi biographical, without any interpretation or appreciation. And there are so many errors, mistakes there. But if you try, if you try to correct some uh, innocent details, uh, it will be changed uh, back immediately. So somebody is working on this image of boogeyman, as you have put it. So uh, and that is a kind of, of operation. We can call it Dugin's uh, operation. So the West needs anime, needs uh, the figure, the gestalt uh, to to blame it, to 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 use it uh, when uh, it is uh, necessary, and they have chosen myself. So that was a very serious decision. I think back into the nineties, they they have made uh, research in Russia, and Zhirinovsky was too too cynical, too clownish uh, clown, and they they tried to do the same from Lebed, General Lebed, as huge Russian beer general with, uh, with low voice and, and so on. But finally, they have chosen myself in order to create a, a new uh, negative uh, picture of Russia. 
Gulag, uh, revolution, slavery, bears in the streets, and Dugin at the top of it with with his birth. So that was Rasputin's Putin uh, topic, and uh, and that is a kind of propaganda. But there is a kind of a nucleus, the kind of uh, core, uh, very uh, very logical core in this attitude, because it is difficult to find in the world uh, the philosopher with so clearly anti-liberal position. So I am really, and the reality, a kind of a champion of illiberalism. So I detest liberalism in all its form, old liberalism, new liberalism, middle uh, liberalism. I reject any kind of political philosophy based on the individuality, individualism, capitalism, uh, liberal democracy, um, including starting from nominalism position and uh, scholastic uh, quarrels. And in that sense, I am disciple of uh, disciple of René Guénon, a, a traditionalist school. So I reject the modernity and I, on the contrary, I uh, am on the side uh, of tradition. So I am against the West and the modernity. So modern West, it is the worst thing that I could imagine. So there is uh, some rational, rational basis in this demonization. The image, finally, is totally perverted. That is caricature, and I agree. But the core uh, uh, of this uh, label to call me the most dangerous philosopher is not too far from 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 uh, the reality, because I I uh, challenge everything in the Western modern liberal society, from starting from the principles to the last results. Uh, and uh, I think that Marxists uh, before, in the early stages, in the earlier periods, were uh, such criti uh, critics, so radical critics of the Western liberal modernity, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a kind of huge, and maybe before, huge betrayal of the Marxism um, regarding the, uh, the, the fight against the uh, capitalist uh, system, and they, they, have, uh, um, they became a kind of tool uh, in the form of liberal uh, uh, classical cultural Marxism. They became a tool of global capitalist uh, system, uh, sharing with them the main, main, uh, main values. So, and nobody, uh, nobody is uh, against. So everybody, either liberals today or um, left liberals or, or or right liberals. So you are perfectly, perfectly invited uh, to 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 be right liberal, or liberal, central liberal, or right uh, left liberal. But you cannot be illiberal. So you cannot be anti-liberal. And that is the kind of rational rational moment in this strategy. So being totally illiberal, and I recognize that. Uh, being neither communist nor fascist at the same time, so I am the perfect target for their uh, for for propaganda of all who share uh, with liberals their agenda. Traditionalism, which you mentioned, is just not well understood by most people who comment on such things, and it just doesn't fit the paradigm, and they don't know how to react to it because it's outside of the modern ideologies, but they can only describe things in terms of modern ideologies. So that is an important point. Exactly. And that is, that is why they try to reduce this fourth uh, political theory, my fourth political theory, to fascism or in some time to communism, Stalinism, so to nationalism. So I am against nationalism, against radical, against all kind of racism or against xenophobia, against uh, uh, atheistic, materialistic communism, but uh, the liberals cannot deal. Uh, they simply cannot 
uh, imagine that uh, their enemy, their opponent, could be outside of their classical um, form. So uh, who is against liberalism? Communists and fascists. So if I am not communist, so I should be fascist. If I am not fascist, I should be communist. If I am neither communist uh, or fascist, I should be both. National <laughs> so yes. something like that, <laughs> and to hold debates with someone who consciously describes himself outside of of this structure: liberalism, communism, and fascism, is something they they could not dare. And that is strange. I thought with Bernard and Levy we could, or, uh, or with Fukuyama, or with Brzezinski, with other intellectuals, for liberal intellectuals that I have met in my life, uh, that um, this uh, new kind of dialogue would be possible. Finally, no. They could not say anything against this forced political theory clearly established and described correctly uh, with details in my in my writings. Maybe they didn't finally uh, read them, or there are some reasons. By they, the only 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 way to deal with my ideas is to reduce to them to something they are not, and after that uh, debates begin. But they have already from the very start they have no no sense, no 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 meaning, nothing. Well, in my opinion, the people you have just mentioned are intellectuals and name only, and their work, I think, is mostly uh, painted by a very deep lack of curiosity, lack of intellectual curiosity. I agree. Um, I also want, I wanted a, a question from a friend of mine, a good friend who lives in Estonia. He recently uh, stumbled upon the information that you went to Tallinn in 1991 and gave uh, lectures on traditionalism. And uh, he asked me to uh, pass on the question whether you have maybe interesting uh, anecdotes about your time in Estonia or if you have anything interesting to say about the country. Well, or... you know, um, I knew uh, interesting people from Estonia, Udom Haliant, Udom Haliant, who was one of the first to translate uh, the works of René Guénon and Henri Corbin in Estonian. I've met him. I have visited uh, the, the, the the rests of the castle of Ungern Sternberg. Oh. Uh, and, <laughs> um, Sare uh, Mahioma. There, there was the, the island of Hioma. Interesting. I was there uh, with the taxi driver, and he has told me many interesting legends uh, about this place, about Hioma, how he uh, was his. Um, uh, friends uh, in the school, they have seen in the garden of uh, ruins of the castle of Ungernsteinberg uh, the vertical serpents between the roses and many other uh, very, very curious uh, things and tales. Uh, and I, I had from Tallinn and from Estonia in general very positive positive uh, impression and uh, I uh, have known the other uh, traditionalists from from Estonia. Some of them, for example, the, the son of Udam Haliant, reassembled the translations of my uh, articles, early articles uh, in Estonian, who his father has made, and now he's going to to, to publish them in Estonian language. So um, I have this episode, not to, to maybe too important, but uh, I, I have very good uh, and I got very good uh, memories from this visit and from castle of Baron Ungelsteinberg, his an uh, ancestors. So I have composed a kind of scenario for, for the picture, for the movie, about uh, Baron Ungern Sternberg, but I have lost uh, that in my papers. Oh, that's sad because I've I've said for years that uh, we really need a good movie about Roman Fyodorovich. I think that would be uh, very important. So, but uh, it is so. Yes. Uh, once upon a time, I even started working on a scenario myself. Oh, great! <laughs> I'm uh, interesting. 
We need some some movie of that kind because he was very atypical hero. He 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 was not uh, normal uh, white. He was not uh, absolutely um, he, he was anti anti red, but he he was the kind of figure of of, si- of such stature that he has impressed uh, Evola and partly Genon as well because uh, he was a kind of mystical figure. So um, his adventure and his spiritual meetings and interests. They are so exciting, I think. So we really like that that, that kind of movie or maybe... Uh, uh, we have dedicated to Ungern Sterling some, some events in Russia, cultural events with um, citing poems and uh, showing the old uh, uh, Soviet film on... Uh, <laughs> And the backstage, so that was funny, I think. But uh, I think his uh, his uh, his stature demands more. Dem- demands r- the, the real movie. Yes, I agree. I was recently rereading his uh, famous Brigas uh, Nomil Pitnatsit, the Order Number Fifteen, which is uh, really an eschatological manifesto and not a simple military order. Very under. Um, I mean, he's famous, but but still not very well understood, I believe. Absolutely, neither here nor there. Interesting that we, we've made uh, one uh, radio show with Eduard Limonov uh, playing the role of uh, of Ungern Sternberg. Uh, that that was a kind of simple version of scenario that I have lost. And uh, there are some uh, bande dessinée comics uh, in uh, French by Hugo Pratt, Hugo Pratt, uh, very famous um, uh, artist uh, dedicated to to Baron uh, Ungern. And there is the book of Jean Mabir uh, in French as well, dedicated to uh, Ungern. There is some mm, small, small uh, circle of his admirers still there in the Europe. <laughs> in the West, uh, in, in Russia as well, I, I suppose. Yes. Um, another question I wanted to ask about in the context of traditionalism. Um, I mean, I, I am somewhat familiar. I am s- consider myself somewhat of a student of René Guénon as well. And um, my question would be, are you familiar with um, Charles Upton? And specifically, uh, the criticism he has, um, well, written and talked about uh, of your work from a attempted perennialist or traditionalist point of view. I've heard of him. He has, this this uh, this man has written to me uh, the, 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 text, the message saying, "I'm going to to make traditionalist criticism of your of your work." Okay, uh, I have responded. N- nice, do it. And he asked, do, uh, do you agree that your main idea is that metaphysics of chaos should replace the traditional form of metaphysics? I have responded, no, any, no, no way. I, the, the, I, I have absolutely different vision of the thing. So um, you are absolutely wrong taking that for not only for the main, my main idea, but one of the important ideas, uh, the, the, the idea of chaos is just, was just the topic of my, my small, small, uh, speech on some congress, but I have spoken about so many things, so many, uh, concepts, theories that you could not say choose one, uh, arbit- in arbitrary way, uh, and, and say, oh, that is the whole Dugin in one, in one word. That's absolutely crazy. It's absolutely incorrect. Upton has said, but I have already finished my book. I wouldn't, uh, uh, write it, uh, uh, once more. So I, I will keep my, my uh, convention that you are, uh, the magical, uh, counter initiating, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, representative of magic of chaos. So let's let's uh, uh, fix the things. I, I have said it's, it is absolutely stupid, useless. Uh, bye bye. Uh, nothing, nothing that. But, uh, and after that, he he tried to somehow to communicate. But I have uh, explained 
why I have no interest to, to continue to hear from, from this person or from the person who read his books. Regarding the, the, the charges of, uh, you know, counter-initiation and uh, magic and whatnot, um, I think uh, a very long time ago, uh, you used to be somewhat involved with people uh, who could be described as such, you know, the uh, Yuzhinsky Kuzhok and so on, and uh, Gaydar Jamal and uh, people like that, and various esoteric groups. I think it would be interesting to hear from you how you view these uh, sorts of ideologies or people nowadays and uh, uh, maybe a bit about your personal, you know, religious journey. That would be very interesting to hear about, I think. So, uh, first of all, these kind of people who I consider my teachers, my masters, they were not occultists, not so much as a terrorists. They were traditionalists. Traditionalists in very particular Soviet time uh, trying to find a way to tradition, to sacredness. In, uh, in, uh, in the situation of the late Soviet period where nothing existed, there was the, the kind of very special historic experience that I, I had as well in my youth that you live in the void. You live in an absolutely void. There is nothing. There, uh, once I, I've tried to ask in some chemistry shop, can you give me some sulfur, salt, uh, and mercury? Uh, I would like to make a kind of optimistic uh, experience. Um, and they say, no, we have nothing. We have only one kind of acid to supply you. So uh, in Soviet Union, there, there, uh, uh, in late Soviet Union, there was absolutely nothing. Everything was uh, totally forgotten, totally lost. And in this situation, uh, situation of macabre, uh, these people as Mamleyev, as Jamal, as Galavin, they tried to break apart through this, uh, this situation to find some Mm, fresh uh, sources of inspirations to, uh, to believe and feel the ideas uh, outside of this hell, hellish context of absence of any kind of, of culture, of, of knowledge, or, of, uh, mm, of philosophy. So they were, uh, they, they lived in that world, they felt this void, and they, for me, they were those who have given me the way out of that. So I, uh, but in my personal experience, first uh, I, I was uh, uh, converted into traditionalism of Genonian type, so I, first I became traditionalist and um, in the half, last half, uh, second half of the 80s, I have uh, entered in the Orthodox Church where I was baptized uh, as a child. So I have rediscovered my Christianity uh, and from that point I never changed uh, I've never changed my mind so uh, and I didn't abandon traditionalism I, I I'm uh, a, a totally traditionalist I I am I follow in my line I am I reject Western modern modernity I praise uh, tr sacred tradition, but in my own personal decision, my tradition coincides absolutely and totally with uh, Christian uh, Orthodox Church. So what this church uh, regards to be true, I, I agree absolutely. If somehow I I, I don't coincide with that. It is my fault. I recognize immediately that that, that is my mistake, and I try to improve uh, the position. So personally, my personal um, attitude is attitude and practice and doctrine and teaching. The only teaching that I have that is a Christian Orthodox tradition. But at the same time, I got a deep respect to the sacred traditions of uh, other people. Uh, I have studied uh, uh, Islamic tradition, I have studied a bit uh, Hindu tradition and uh, 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 other traditions following Genon, but my 
uh, my church is the only one. Uh, uh, I think that uh, Christian Orthodox doctrine is the expression of the absolute truths that I share. And if I decline from that, so it is my fault. And if someone who can point me out where I'm wrong, I would recognize the truth, truths of the other. That I, and I made that, and I'm in my, uh, my proper researches. For, for example, I, in the beginning of the 90s, I have written a book on the metaphysics of uh, Evangel, where I tried to combine Kenonian uh, attitudes and uh, uh, the doctrine of Eastern Christianity. And in every point where I have encountered the contradiction, I, I took the part of the church uh, against Genon, for example, in his, uh, in his uh, Nestorian Islamic Christology, Christology in another point. So I am always uh, uh, on the side of, of, the, of the Christianity. I uh, studied the other tradition as well, as well some some system of systems of beliefs uh, of, of, of Western mystics. There is an interesting aspect of that, but one thing is to explore something, and the other thing uh, is totally other thing is your own beliefs. Yes. Uh, what is your opinion on the current um, status and uh, position of the Orthodox Church in Russia and uh, where is it going? How is it uh, its influence on society and so on? So Russian Orthodox Church uh, is the only uh, authoritative uh, sacred institution and traditional institution we have. The other sacred institution is state because for us Russians, uh, Christians, Eastern Christians, the state, or better to say empire, uh, kingdom, is not only a uh, political uh, instrument as uh, that was in the doctrine of Saint Augustine, um, but for us it is not only only earthly organization. It is a kind of a uh, ladder, a kind uh, uh, kind of um, uh, starway to uh, to the uh, heavenly kingdom. Uh, and the Catechon. So, uh, yes, exactly, exactly. The the the, the, the chief. Of the state is for us the spiritual figure, Katehon, the keeper who keeps the world in front of the coming Antichrist. So that is a scatological mission of Russian state to fight against the, the common, coming Satan uh, in the history. And uh, so for us, uh, Christian church and uh, uh, Russian states are both both uh, structures with immense uh, spiritual meaning. So, uh, but I, I think that uh, speaking about uh, about church, church in Russia is the main and main important organization. But after so many so many hundred years of very particular, very very uh, dubious situation in the. Uh, first of all, after the, the reforms of the Peter the Great, when he enslaved the church, uh, he has put the church under the control of, of secular state. So uh, all, all, all the institutions in the beginning of 18th century were desacralized, modernized, westernized uh, state and church. And after that, there was the communist period of, of uh, martyrdom of our church. So it is not easy to, to get back for the church to, to accomplish its mission. It is on the way. It is on the way of the great spiritual return. It, it is not easy because, uh, first of all, our church uh, from the 90s, the, a, the end of 80s, was uh, busy only with reconstruction of the temples or, or of the buildings that was very the huge huge uh, activity of the monastery and so on and so on but now i think we are approaching the the second period of the modern post-soviet 
church uh, history is the spiritual rebuilding of, of our society. So the Russian church is uh, now in the transition between the first stage of material renaissance reconstruction to uh, to the spiritual renaissance and that is very very particular moment and uh, 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 many things uh, depend on the relations between the church and state because they are two church and state both they are spiritual uh, traditional institutions of us and we need to revival them both we could not depend or, or, or hope only on the uh, resurrection of uh, spirituality and put aside and leave aside the, the state, or we could not hope for a, a kind of development of the state and a, a revival of the state and sovereignty without church. So they are uh, so strongly interconnected in our tradition and i think that is the main the main uh, the main goal of russian future and uh, we, we we are going th this uh, this way we are restoring now uh the glory of our holy empire the moscow third rome the catechonic uh, stature and title and the function and mission of uh, our leader that uh, so we are restoring our glory and maybe we are in the beginning of the more important process of the eschatological revival of the humanity in this uh, focus of uh, revival of the Holy Russia. You mentioned uh, in the question before uh, your respect for other religious traditions that are outside of the Christian tradition and before that about your uh, time in Estonia, which you enjoyed, and uh, I came to the question, um, your other travels, um, which uh, countries did you enjoy visiting, which uh, other peoples, aside from the Russian people, have you uh, encountered, which you felt were maybe kindred to Russians, or maybe which you just personally sympathize with, so basically, yeah, things like this. So it is difficult to say because when I come to some country, to some people, I uh, don't measure the quality of the people and society by their attitude toward us, Russians. So I'm not absolutely Russia-centric. So I try to evaluate the completely different aspect. I try to understand people, to feel, uh, to feel my uh, cultural ambience and the earth and the, and the, uh, and the science and the spiritual presence uh, that um, is you know, very different uh, in different uh, parts of the world. So I, I could express my just my impressions. So I, I really fall in love uh, in the beginning of the 90s with Serbia. I don't know why. So maybe there are some historical reasons why uh, I love uh, Serbia. Maybe there are not so much, but when I was there in the beginning of the 90s, uh, including in the Bosnia and Herzegovina, in, in the front line, and other places of the uh, um, and, uh, Yugoslavia, there was Yugoslavia still there. So I fall in love. I, I just have fallen in love with Serbia, and this feeling is so deep, it's so irrational. So I could not explain that. I just love Serbs. I don't know why. I not. I don't know <laughs> what for. But I really love um, uh, Serbia, and I always am, uh, am on the side of the Serbia and its tragic situation. Uh, I uh, very much like Italia. Um, I have so many friends. So in in Italy, in Italy, I have uh, more followers than in all the world. More books published there. So. Uh, if I come, for example, uh, last uh, last time when I visited Sicily, I was um, in a small city in Sicily at, the, at midnight. I came out from, from the car with my friends and there was people in the night in the Sicilian city that, uh, that have recognized myself and, and said, oh, we have heard you here, Mr. Dugan. So, uh, Senor Dugan, uh, 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 that's a very, very, very special kind of relations. I don't know why, but I understand Italians 
they understand uh, uh, myself. We have in the in a very intensive dialogue, philosophical dialogue, not with one, two, three, maybe some group of the people, but with Italy. I feel Italy from the north uh, to the south, and I have so many. Uh, friends there, so and they they as well they pay the same price because, for example, when my daughter was killed, uh, some Italians they uh, uh, among them um, very important composer um, uh, Angelo Inglese, they have composed the opera for Daria and they have staged it uh, different times in different theaters. So. Uh, they have published already five books dedicated to my daughter, and they are so loyal, these people in Italy, so open, so emotionally sincere that I, I, I cannot recognize in them Europeans. They are not Europeans. They are, they are something uh, different. Maybe they are Romans. Maybe <laughs> the Italy is uh, such beautiful and perfect land with such feelings of uh, uh, of the beauty of the of of, of the truth uh, of, of the seriousness of the heroic action so Italy, the other land that I, I adore, absolutely adore Italy. In the theory, in the metaphysic, uh, in the field of metaphysics, my beloved country is Iran. Not so much uh, Iran as uh, we know, as we could visit, but metaphysical Iran. So eternal Iran. Iran as the heart of uh, the, uh, the, the, the metaphysical tradition of, of the light, of the, of the the uh, war of the light, uh, and uh, I uh, recognize the, the traces, the, the rests of this tradition, including in modern Iran. I very I much love uh, uh, Shia, Shiism, Iranian Shiism, Iranian tradition, spiritual. I have as well many followers there. I, I like Turkey as well. There are many people who are very open to Eurasianism there. Uh, when I, uh, I have visited for the first time Brazil, I didn't know much about this country. Uh, and as well, uh, uh, Brazil has conquered me with its music, with its open people, with its uh, uh, flexibility. Uh, uh, and so, uh, and intellectually, I would say, I'm mostly French because uh, sometimes I I I, I think uh, in the fr French language because I I've started to to learn with Genon and with French philosophy, so I am still very indebted for French culture and above all to Nouvelle Droite, uh, uh, to Alain de Benoit, my great friend. So recently, I I very very inclined to to France and finally uh, in the language um, and not uh, of the language of rational language of um, in the in the question of the uh, language as such uh, I am for sure German because uh, I, I uh, every day I read some uh, some books or pages that depends on the time in German because German metaphysics it's something that inspired me as well as Greece, uh, but ancient Greece. So uh, I, I, uh, uh, the most important, as my daughter used to say, my uh, preferred journey would be in ancient Greece. Where do you like to go to ancient Greece? She responded. So uh, and this, it is a part of uh, the kind of joke, but uh, the Greece as well is extremely important important country, but it existed in its uh, its philosophers, in its uh, th theater, in its uh, uh, culture. So, uh, so in, in that sense, in that sense, you, you can you can say that I uh, I uh, being absolutely Russian in in, in blood, in, in culture and language in in uh, style of living, in the soul, in the heart, in the spirit. I am very open to other uh, cultures. Uh, I appreciate them and I uh, have um, friends uh, 
uh, that I love and who love me as well uh, in all the world, in the Arab world, in the United States as well. You can you cannot imagine. I have many friends there, and the kind of dialogue with them is very enriching. So uh, against all this liberal elite, there are other America, uh, and uh, it's very interesting. So I don't despise any any people i am uh, i was in india in japan as well in many other countries and almost everywhere i find something something uh, that um, is uh, uh, is worth to to love to know to explore to, to to have friendships so the world is full of beautiful things beautiful landscapes beautiful historical places with beautiful beautiful people uh, in spite of this globalization <clears throat> yes uh, russians seem to have this trait of easily falling in love with uh, different cultures so in a way we are a very cosmopolitan even nation but uh, there is a question is global tourism as an extension of globalization a net harm on humanity as a whole and what do you think about the global tourism Yes, I simply hate it. I hate it. I think that is the worst thing to be tourists. It is just the kind of accusation, insult. But you're also yeah, tourists, tourist. no? <laughs> so tourist, it, uh, tourist, it, it is a kind of um, underhuman to be. It is, it is just a beast, a globalist, liberal <laughs> beast who don't understand anything in the culture. You shouldn't be tourist. Very first thought when you heard of the beginning of the special military operation and after these nine long years? I, I, I thought, finally, second thought, maybe too late. Third thought, we will pay for that a huge price we don't imagine yet. That's enough for a free version. A full two-hour version of our conversation can be accessed on RWA, Patreon or Gumroad. Go to a description box and pick any membership tier you want. And you will get a full access to all of our interviews, historical episodes, military analysis, news digests and uh, cultural exploration. And besides, you will get access to our secret chat, where we will be hosting Russian lessons for everyone who is interested. I think it's a pretty damn good deal. See you there.